Ja, Ilja Lusjak, eh, välkommen hit. Som är en gammal vän till, oj, ja. <laughs> till, till instituttet med ett eh, flertal besök i en historia mycket, mycket längre än jag. Och, eh, och vi ska också säga att under kommunikationens gång här så har Ilja och jag upptäckt ett antal beröringspunkter. För, förutom det att Ilja var högre rankad än jag faktiskt för en tjänst jag nu har men drog sig ut för en annan tjänst. Vilket jag är mycket tacksam för naturligtvis. Då har vi också hittat beröringspunkter mellan våra släkter och andra. Så det är mycket roligt att få välkomna Ilja som tidigare inte har träffat eh, hit. Och ämnet är, är spännande. Det, jag tycker det är viktigt att uppmärksamma det som är en svensk tradition inom, inom naturliga forskningen. Låt mig också säga att det här föredraget ordnas och Ilas besök anordnas med stöd från Vänigren Distelserna. Eh, som vi är väldigt mycket glada av. Och med det sagt så lämnar jag över ordet till professor Lusen. Tack, Fredrik. Fredrik sa att jag skulle prata i engelska. Jag sa svenska, spanska och engelska. Men så är det att det i engelska. Som Fredrik sa, det här projektet är en del av... Är engelska? Fine for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Well, <laughs> then, then we won't do Spanish. Uh, this is part of uh, a l- a large project that that looks at uh, the reality and the myth behind Axelvenegrin, particularly uh, from uh, looking at the political. Uh, dimension of his life, not so much the, the economic. And I don't know even if Frederick knows this, but uh, originally the Latin American Institute uh, used to be in the Venegrain Center. Mm-hmm. And that's when uh, Gunnar Myrdal uh, was the, the head of the, of the institute. So Frederick is following a line of uh, very distinguished uh, Swedish scientists who have been in charge of the institute. So the, the project, and I can tell you later more about it, uh, uh, th- so this is a part that has to do with Axel Wenegrin's contribution to, uh, in this uh, particular case, uh, Peru. And uh, as we know, uh, two years ago, we celebrated the 100th year anniversary of uh, the discovery of Machu Picchu by Hiram Bingham. And uh, there, there's still remaining controversy about uh, who really discovered uh, Machu Picchu. And uh, I think uh, if we would ask uh, any uh, Swede walking uh, in, the, in the rain uh, outside uh, whether they know that one of their countrymen had uh, a rather significant importance uh, in, uh, in discovering uh, several sites uh, around Machu Picchu. Uh, I think few, uh, few would uh, know this, and this is even not uh, well known in uh, the archaeological and anthropological community, and I will explain to you the reasons why it isn't known. It has to do with uh, how uh, Wenegrin was falsely accused of uh, being uh, an agent for the Nazi regime and he was blacklisted uh, by the United States and as part of uh, this research I found the proof and I will show you that it had nothing to do at all with his uh, allegedly uh, sympathies for Nazi Germany. The file on Wendell Green uh, in the, the FBI file would start here and goes to the end of the table. It is uh, the second largest file in the American archives uh, uh, and uh, took me a while to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly it is uh, yeah, fiction. Uh, but uh, so uh, what uh, as I said few people know what Wiener Green uh, really accomplished and uh, that the area around Machu Picchu 
used to be called the Venegrin National Park. It was a designation by then President Manuel Prado. Uh, the leaders of the expedition, which included uh, Axel Venegrin, uh, received the highest uh, academic uh, distinctions. Venegrin received the highest order of Peru, uh, the order of the sun. And uh, how this all came about, I want to give you a, a little uh, background about Axel Wiener-Green, because even in Sweden, uh, he is uh, to some degree forgotten. And it has to do, on the one hand, with Svenska uh, Aron Schükan, I would say, uh, because he was too rich, too quick, too successful, and then he did something you're also not supposed to do in Sweden, he failed, and <laughs> in the end he lost uh, uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars that he had, and what remains are, uh, I will show you that at the end, are two uh, important foundations. Uh, the largest foundation funding anthropology in the world right now is the Benner Green Foundation for Anthropological Research in New York, and then uh, we have the Benner Green uh, Foundations in uh, here in Stockholm, and, uh, but most Swedes have really no idea what this foundation does, and it is an uh, amazing institution by itself. So, why do I come to Mr. Winograin, and here we have him, uh, so he came 80 years uh, old, uh, uh, comes from uh, Udevala, rather, from um, sort of a bourgeois family. Uh, one of the stories is that uh, Karl the Jude and the Johan uh, uh, was at the, their home for dinner on his way uh, to <coughs> Norway. I don't know it is, wh whether that is true or not. Uh, but the reason I'm doing uh, the research is because of this beautiful woman. And this beautiful woman is my grandmother. And uh, my Grandmother, as you can tell from the name, uh, that's also Vena Green. So, uh, but she remarried after my grandfather died and married the brother of Axel Vena Green. So, as a child, I've heard a lot of stories and uh, spent a lot of time with my grandmother when she was older. And, uh, she was telling me a lot of stories. And uh, here's my grandfather. She was married. Uh, uh, until he died, and uh, my grandfather was the Swedish uh, ambassador to Germany from uh, 1927, 26 <coughs> till 1937, and that is another reason I was interested because my grandfather was uh, one of the first uh, public figures who warned about what was coming in uh, Nazi Germany. That time uh, people in Sweden uh, didn't take him seriously. Uh, but he, uh, he was declared persona non grata because he had helped uh, so many Jews to flee from Germany and Hitler told him that he would not no longer respect his uh, diplomatic immunity so he was transferred to Rome. When was that? That was in 1937. But, you know, I don't uh, spend a lot, several years of my life doing research uh, only because of stories that I've heard in my family. No, the research really has to do with Fidel Castro. I am a Latin Americanist, and that's why we are at the Latin American Institute. And I work, my uh, area of specialty are guerrilla movements and particularly the role that women play. And I had just published a book on, uh, on Cuba and that looked at the role of women in the revolution and in the current political system. And I was in Mexico and uh, uh, Axel Wiener-Green had a large estate there in Mexico and uh, my grandmother had always told me about it so I went there. And this is now a hotel, and it is uh, directed or run by uh, former Cuban diplomats who uh, 
uh, while they were serving in Mexico, decided that it was better to stay in Mexico. And they, uh, after they realized who I was, and you know, this is uh, the presidential suite of that hotel is Axel Menegrin's bedroom, uh, where of course I was invited to stay, uh, <laughs> and uh, then they told me that uh, Axel Wenergren had sold the ship Granma to Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, uh, which the 86 Cuban revolutionaries, uh, internationalists, took from Mexico in 1956 to Cuba to start the Cuban Revolution. Yes. <laughs> That story I don't believe. <laughs> uh, but he said, well, this is this is a true story and I was so I was intrigued and uh, intrigued enough that I proposed just a, made a little proposal to the Venegrain Foundation and they said, Are you interested in finding out? And they were. So I started uh, my research. And it took me a long time, uh, can't imagine uh, how long it took me, to track down the person who actually uh, bought the ship Granma for Fidel Castro and uh, Che Guevara. He is still alive. His name is Antonio del Conde. He is a Mexican arms dealer uh, born in <laughs> New York. And he came, this is how he came to the interview. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me that no, he had sold it to uh, a couple. I mean, he had bought it from a couple by the name of Eriksson. Uh, so th this was a Swedish name. So there, there was some reason behind it, and you know, people, uh, everything surrounding the Cuban Revolution and also things surrounding Axel Wiener Green are. Uh, uh, always very mysterious, secretive, and myth-based. So I thought, where is that information coming from? So sure enough, uh, after another while of research, I found a authorized biography on Che Guevara that Fidel Castro had honored uh, with an inscription at the, uh, while he was in Moscow. And there it says that the Swedish ethnographer Axel Wenergren sold uh, Fidel to ship Granma. It turned out that the author is a former uh, Russian uh, KGB officer, uh, unfortunately now dead, so I, I couldn't interview him. Why he, uh, where he got that information? Um, why this is in a book? I mean, Fidel Castro presumably knows uh, whom he bought it from, and I was very close to getting an interview with him, but uh, in the end he uh, he had uh, health problems and he he couldn't see me. Uh, so uh, this is just a, a brief uh, look at how uh, Venegrin came to be the founder of the major expeditions and of foundations and he uh, he built this uh, empire with this vacuum cleaner which he discovered in Vienna of all places and uh, it was really uh, like in the case of uh, Nobel not a discovery, it was the discovery of improvement uh, dynamite had existed before in the case of Nobel and so the vacuum cleaner but Wenergren's genius was that he uh, made it into a small appliance and uh, this was uh, the owner of the shop where he saw the vacuum cleaner. And then he went into uh, uh, the refrigerator and the reason the refrigerator became so extremely popular in, uh, in Sweden was not because it was invented by two brilliant Swedish scientists but because it had a special uh, place uh, where you could put the lens in, and you see that Eden, he had, had an, on the on the roof a little uh, dentation, so you could put the bottle in straight. <laughs> uh, Vinogren uh, also uh, uh, 
published the, the, a manifesto uh, with his political and economic uh, philosophy called the Vedantit Eva, or Call to uh, Reason. And uh, there he uh, laid out that, uh, which is true, that modern science has created the basis that we all should be wealthy. Well, Menegrin certainly uh, was wealthy himself. So he, uh, here is the, the Menegrin Palace, uh, that is uh, Diplomat Staden, it's now the South Korean uh, Embassy. Uh, uh, that's what he bought first, then he bought Herringer Castle, which is, uh, looks now today uh, like this. It had the first uh, largest uh, outdoor pool in Scandinavia, and Great Garbo used to swim there naked. Uh, but <laughs> alas, uh, uh, I don't know what beautiful guests they have to these days. I mean, I guess they do sometimes, but I haven't found a great Agarbo. Uh Then he bought the largest private yard in the world. Uh, uh, it's 110 meters long and he bought it from Howard Hughes, an uh, American uh, multimillionaire. And on that, he would he would sail around the world, and I'm showing this boat because this is how Menegrin would go to Peru and or go to Argentina, to Rio. He was uh, everywhere in uh, in Latin America. And he bought another uh, little place, Paradise Island in the Bahamas. Uh, he owned the whole island, uh, which now would be a incredible uh, fortune. Uh, this is still, this is the garden. I took that picture two years ago. It's uh, beautiful. And then he, in Mexico, he had an estate, uh, the Rancho Cortez, uh, and it's called Cortez because supposedly uh, Anan Cortez had his horses there. And then uh, this is what it looks like now. Now it's a, it's a hotel, the Hotel Racket. And uh, this is uh, the introduction that leads us to uh, the uh, to the expedition itself. Uh, when a grain and and the it is sort of important to know that even the story how the the expedition started because uh, of the controversy surrounding uh, the expedition. Uh, when a grain had a good. Uh, friend who was the American ambassador here in uh, Stockholm, who then served as ambassador to Peru, and he invited him to come to Peru and uh, said he uh, needs to see the archaeological wonders, but it certainly also helped that uh, he wrote to Menegrin that the country is probably one of the potentially richest in the world, and uh, Menegrin uh, knew how to make money, and he was always looking for ways uh, uh, to do so. And uh, on his first uh, visit to uh, Peru in the uh, beginning of 1939, uh, just uh, before the World War II was, uh, was starting, uh, he was in Peru, and as it always was with Venegrin, uh, when his boat was landing in the harbor, the president was uh, standing there receiving him like the guest of honor, and then uh, he President Prado showed him his private uh, collection, and he had brought in the head of the University of Cusco as his uh, Wenergren's uh, personal guide. And uh, this is when Wenergren uh, fell in love with uh, Peru and promised to uh, come back. And Wenergren uh, had become friends with the man called Paul. Uh, who uh, was a Hungarian and uh, made a few films in, in Hollywood that were quite successful and at the time was uh, working as a uh, shooting documentaries for uh, Svenska Film Institute and uh, they had met uh, in Singapore and uh, Feyos was supposed to go back uh, to the Far East to uh, to do another documentary, but Venegrin convinced him, said, no, uh, go, and go to Peru, I'm going to finance an expedition for you, uh, you should uh, explore, uh, explore, uh, explore this. Uh, well, 
Thales had, he was not an anthropologist, his background was he had a degree in uh, medicine uh, from uh, Budapest University and then he had worked in the United States uh, as a filmmaker, but uh, he, he was a, an adventurer and so what he... What was his name? Paul Thales, F-E-G-O-S, Thales. Uh, and you will see a picture of him later with his name. Uh, Theos's interest was to uh, study a, a native tribe in the Amazonas uh, called the Yaguas uh, that had previously uh, not been studied. But as it always happens so many times, you start a research project, then you go on an expedition, then you do something totally different. So while he is in uh, in uh, in Peru, and this is now the beginning of 1940, he hears uh, uh, from uh, this rector of the university and others that uh, there are uh, very important uh, scientific discoveries to be made uh, around uh, Machu Picchu and the Inca Trail. And uh, And, and they has convinced the, the authorities in Cusco to uh, send the inspector of antiquities, uh, uh, Roberto Rosas, uh, on this expedition with him. And sure enough, uh, they found an old, overgrown Inca town that I will uh, show you in a in a second called uh, Puyo Patamarca. And that created such a sensation in Mexico. It was. I've read all the newspapers from uh, from the time uh, uh, that uh, Axel Wenner Green uh, created that whole foundation, the Viking uh, uh, foundation, was then called, uh, in order to uh, give additional funding uh, to the expedition. And uh, he uh, also decided that this was so important that he wanted to see it for himself. So he. Uh, set sails uh, from the Bahamas uh, to uh, Calao in Peru, uh, got the presidential train, uh, went up to, uh, to Cusco and uh, joined uh, the, exp the expedition. And uh, this is of course the site, uh, I don't know if many of you have been in uh, Machu Picchu, it really is uh, uh, spectacular. Uh, but in order to uh, get there, you can either take uh, a train or you can walk. And when you walk, then you walk the old uh, trail of uh, the Incas. And uh, this is where, this is uh, uh, Paul Fajos uh, in the Andes at the beginning of, uh, of the expedition. And uh, here is Axel Wenergren in uh, in the Andes at uh, over 3,000 uh, meters, and he had just turned 60 years, which for that time, I mean, I've been there last year and uh, not 60 uh, yet, but uh, to walk up uh, all this way, he was in, in pretty good shape. And he walked up. Uh, yeah. And here are the two of them, and now, if you can see that on that sign, it says the Venegrain Scientific <laughs> Expedition to Hispanic America, Camp Number 64. And this is right, this whole expedition is a project of a year and a half. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they went, and this is uh, one place that uh, they excavated Cachapamba. Uh, Choque Suyu is, uh, is another one, as you see, it has uh, interesting terraces. Sayak uh, Marca, uh, looks like an old Inca fortress. Uh, uh, this is uh, Puyo Pata Marca, and uh, it's, uh, the many of the structures are almost as elaborate as in uh, in Machu Picchu, uh, particularly before they started the reconstruction of Machu Picchu, because a lot of it wasn't <laughs> that you see now was never there. Uh, 
and this is Inti Pata th that is uh, just right next to uh, uh, to Machu Picchu, uh, and then uh, th they discovered the site of uh, Vinya Vaina, and Vinya Vaina uh, is still considered that's the the site comparable to uh, to Machu Picchu. It is uh, it is enormous, and uh, what is uh, interesting is that the expedition managed to change several of the names that Hiram Bingham had given to uh, at least two of the sites. Uh, well, the name Vinyavaina uh, was suggested by uh, the father of uh, Peruvian anthropology, Julio C. Tello. For those of you that have been in Peru, uh, his statue is, uh, is everywhere. And uh, Venegrain, uh, not being an anthropologist or archaeologist himself, uh, he hired uh, Julio Citeo to uh, be the, the expert on, uh, on the expedition. And uh, they discovered this site at, uh, at the very end of, uh, of the expedition. And uh, because of the time of the year, it was November in 1941, uh, they had to uh, break off uh, their work and Venegrain and Feos uh, returned to uh, uh, left Peru, but they hired, uh, they funded Julio Ceteo to go back the following year with uh, what was then uh, funding in hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in today's money, uh, to go back and to uh, to excavate it and uh, and clear and clear the the, the site. Now the expedition, uh, as you can tell from the sites, well there there were thousands of photographs taken because. Uh, Paul Thetis was, was a filmmaker, and his contribution was that he uh, he documented everything. So in the archives in New York, there are thousands of photographs. But uh, even with some of the photographs, it's impossible to imagine the extent of this expedition. There were, at the high point, they had 900 uh, laborers. And in the in the base camps, there were up to 350 people that were living. So just to uh, logistically to feed them and to uh, to either carry uh, the food and the equipment up uh, or to uh, to use uh, uh, donkeys or mules, uh, it was uh, quite a feat. And uh, the so thousands of uh, People in the local population were uh, employed by by this from uh, by this expedition during uh, uh, a long time, and this is really the reason why the whole area was uh, nom denominated uh, the Venegrain National Park. It was in, in gratitude uh, to uh, the Venegrain, and uh, I have. Uh, Researched this in the in the Peruvian uh, archives in the original documents. So uh, uh, almost everything I can say, uh, if you uh, challenge me, I can show you a document uh, uh, that proves it. Uh, and so the they called it uh, the Venegrin uh, National Park, and uh, but of course there was this expect. Uh, that the president of Peru and several high authorities had that Venegrain would use part of his uh, fortune to invest in uh, in Peru. So uh, immediately when he uh, arrived, he uh, he was made uh, uh, he got an honorary doctorate from the University of Cusco. Uh, Paul Feig was uh, was uh, became. Uh, Honorary uh, professor, he, uh, the president came and gave him uh, the order of uh, 
of the sun and uh, when I left the diary uh, that uh, I found there and he uh, he always loved it when he took himself well it was a contradiction he had so he was a sales genius but he was a very shy uh, very private person but he really appreciated when he was uh, honored uh, like a president and uh, so he's recounting at dinner in his honor at the presidential palace he writes in his diary big dinner for us at the president's palace Marguerite his wife and I were given the seats of honor before ambassadors and ministers and thus it was sensational nice occasion and the president very gracious so this was a, a good day and in this diary uh, you know I mean Vanegrain literally uh, he met with uh, every head of uh, state uh, uh, in the 1930s and uh, 40s and whatever country he uh, he visited uh, well immediately uh, after he uh, got all of his distinctions, uh, that is to say, a week uh, after uh, Vanegreen uh, endowed uh, the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cusco, which was the first uh, archaeology department uh, in, uh, in Peru. And he gave uh, the equivalent of, uh, no, he gave a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand soles, uh, uh, that is uh, was then uh, fifteen thousand dollars. It would now be uh, several hundred thousand dollars, and that was to endow the the chair for the department and to uh, to keep the the department uh, running. And uh, of course, the only person with a doctorate in Peru at the time in uh, in archaeology was uh, Julio C. Tello. Uh, he had uh, he had studied at uh, at Yale and uh, then in uh, in England and so uh, the first director that uh, they hired because it's they were very specific that they wanted a scientist of the first order uh, since Julio Citeo was not uh, at the disposal. Uh, the the highest uh, North American uh, doctoral student who had worked on on the expedition uh, by the name of uh, John Rowe and who has become uh, became a very famous uh, uh, Peruvian uh, anthropologist uh, but of course uh, he didn't think that uh, the salary of uh, a Peruvian professor uh, was right at was adequate for him, so his salary was five times as high, and so immediately, instead of uh, uh, the salaries being paid from the interest, uh, it was paid from uh, the endowment. So the endowment was uh, shrinking, and uh, uh, but the the foundation in New York and uh, and the department maintained relationships until. Uh, the 1950s, but uh, there were also some contact in, uh, until the 1960s, but then uh, uh, Fatos uh, died and the subsequent uh, presidents of the Menegrin Foundation uh, were, not, were no longer, uh, yeah, didn't stay in, uh, in contact. Uh, but the it still exists, uh, the department. Uh, it has uh, uh, it's now the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology. It has more than 500 students, respectively, and it has trained a whole uh, several generations of uh, Peruvian anthropologists. Uh, many of the guides in, uh, that are registered that are guides at Machu Picchu, they all have uh, been, uh, been trained there. So. Uh, When uh, Venegrain leaves Peru, he uh, he has one of the Peruvian ministers on board. Is sort of uh, to uh, be close to Venegrain and make sure that uh, Venegrain really invests in uh, Peru 
because he had promised to uh, to rebuild the harbor of uh, Chipotle and to invest in uh, all kinds of mineral extractions. But he had also uh, been invited to, to come to Peru by uh, then President Camacho and his uh, brother Maximino uh, Camacho. And uh, this is now the end of uh, 1942. And if you read the newspapers in the United States in uh, November of 1942, it says Axel Wenner Green has invested 100 million dollars in Mexico. Well, uh, the war had started. Uh, the United States was uh, was not in it uh, yet. Uh, here's another picture of Vinnie Weiner. Uh, Ms. Paul Fails uh, sitting at the Anthropological uh, Foundation. Uh, but here is uh, the nemesis uh, of Axel Wenegreen, Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller uh, at times even collaborated with uh, Wenegreen. Uh, for example, uh, the, the Wenegreen Institute uh, in Stockholm, uh, uh, biochemistry, uh, etc., that was uh, funded, co funded by uh, uh, Rockefeller and Wenegreen. Uh, but Rockefeller uh, area of expertise and specialty was, uh, was Latin America. And uh, he was uh, appointed by uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, as the coordinator for inter-American uh, affairs. And his, his charge was to uh, observe uh, uh, and watch whether there would be any German activity in South America and uh, to report on it. And uh, Menard Green had met with uh, Rockefeller and had told him about the expedition before he even went to uh, uh, Peru and told him about these plans. But uh, Menard Green, in the eyes of uh, Rockefeller, was suspicious enough that he sent a spy along. Uh, it was a professor of uh, German uh, from Stanford University that was. Uh, was basically working while well, the CIA didn't uh, exist then, but uh, he was working on behalf of uh, U.S. intelligence uh, in uh, in Latin America and was part of uh, joint the expedition. And said he was interested to come along, and after several months, he realized that it had nothing to do with uh, any Nazi activity and uh, that uh, the head uh, Feos was uh, vehemently. Uh, Anti, uh, anti-Nazi. But why uh, would they send a, a spy uh, along? Uh, Werner Green, of course, having a, a global uh, business empire, had uh, interests in Germany and indeed had close contacts with uh, some uh, uh, leading uh, personalities of uh, the Third Reich. And uh, Axel Wenegreen was blacklisted uh, by the United States, and uh, he was black. This was a, a list uh, that listed all persons that uh, were either had uh, business activities with uh, Nazi Germany or were considered uh, German nationals or other nationals with uh, sympathies for the Nazis, and therefore uh, potentially. Uh, dangerous. And uh, the official explanation that uh, the, one gets in the United States is that Leonard Green was blacklisted because uh, he was a Nazi sympathizer. But uh, as so many other things, of course, the blacklist was used also to eliminate uh, economic competitors or uh, political rivals. Uh, and this is what I We'll show you uh, briefly because this relates also to the to the expedition. 
Now one of the highlights of uh, Axel Wenergren's life was that he was invited to spend a weekend at the White House. And uh, this was in 1936. And Wenergren told uh, FDR how he uh, could get the United States out of the recession. So <laughs> and he uh, he was so extremely uh, successful also in, uh, in the United States that uh, uh, that was the reason that he was uh, invited. And uh, so this was one of the high points in his uh, life uh, and the blacklisting of course was one of the low points of his life because uh, the person who signed that was also uh, FDR. Well, Werner Green of course had connections in Germany. He had this uh, on the right is Alfred uh, Krupp von Bohlen und Heilbach, uh, the heir of uh, uh, the Krupp uh, Empire, and uh, Axel had done business with his father already, and uh, Alfred and uh, Axel were very uh, close friends. Uh, they also were getting some business uh, ventures and. Uh, uh, Krupp at the time had uh, considerable interests in uh, in the Swedish armaments industry, which uh, then, when laws were were changed, he had this invest and uh, Benagrin took them over. And one could certainly uh, say that uh, Benagrin did it uh, on behalf of uh, of Krupp and but had interests. Uh, but as we all know. Uh, uh, Axel Wenergren was not the only Swede who had uh, close ties with uh, Germans. Uh, here we have uh, Crown Prince uh, Gustav Adolf uh, to the left, uh, Hermann uh, Göring, who of course had this connection since he was married uh, to Swedish wife Karin uh, at the time, and uh, uh, Gustav uh, den Femte. And uh, in that sense, uh, Sweden and I think we uh, we don't talk that much about it in uh, Sweden these days. But uh, uh, Sweden was not a very uh, popular country uh, during the 1940s in the United States because it uh, its uh, neutrality was seen as. Uh, really aiding and abetting uh, Nazi Germany and uh, then particularly the controversial train route uh, to uh, that uh, Sweden permitted uh, for the Germans uh, up to Narvik uh, was seen really as uh, basically Sweden had hand handed over their neutrality. Uh, Werner Green uh, on the invitation of uh, of Göring uh, played uh, the role of a peace uh, negotiator and uh, for a while he flew back between uh, uh, Berlin and London uh, meeting with uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain and bringing him uh, a private message from uh, Göring and then he was going back to uh, Göring with the message from uh, Chamberlain and the introduction to uh, Chamberlain had come uh, from uh, uh, Gustav Adolf's uh, son, Gustav den Schäfte, Adolf, who, uh, because as we know, in Sweden uh, we have both, uh, we have a lot of uh, German princesses uh, and we have a lot of uh, British princesses. And uh, uh, so Swedes were close to uh, England and to, uh, and to Germany. Uh, so the, there was a lot of evidence that uh, these connections were there, but uh, this wasn't a, a secret. On the contrary, uh, on, uh, on one of his uh, trips, uh, uh, Green cabled uh, President Roosevelt and said, you know, I have important information uh, for you, but my boat is uh, relatively slow, but if you will send one of your uh, fast boats, then I can be at the White House tomorrow, <laughs> you know, to give you uh, an account. Uh, it, it was rather amazing. Well, one of the reasons why Maynard Green was 
consider it. If you uh, if you Google Axel Wiener Green, there are tens of thousands of hits, and there is so much that is written, and it's almost all fantasy. But mm. uh, this woman actually uh, did exist, Inga Arver, the, the Danish beauty queen, who uh, uh, interviewed Adolf Hitler. Uh, a number of times and published glowing reports in the, the Danish newspapers about the Führer and he invited her also uh, to be his guest at the 1936 uh, Olympics and uh, Inga Arvid happened to be uh, married to Paul Fagels, uh, <laughs> the head of uh, the Menabrain Foundation. And she was married to, to him? To no. Fagels, no. yeah. And uh, then she came uh, to uh, the States, and when she came to the States, she had an affair with uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I read the, oh. the wiretaps, uh, you know, the United States, uh, as we know, it, this is just the most recent news about that they listened to our phone conversations, but they listened in also to John F. Kennedy's uh, when he was... Uh, making a pillow talk with Inga Arvid and at one point uh, they were talking about Axel Wienergren and uh, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy said to Inga uh, you know, you really need to uh, distance himself uh, from Wienergren because of uh, his reputation and this was in, uh, in 1942 so what did Inga do because she loved John F. Kennedy uh, she immediately divorced her husband who was then at the the expedition in Peru and she used uh, he said he had abandoned her being on that expedition and uh, went to Reno and at the time you had to be a resident there for three uh, weeks and then he could get a divorce because she wanted to marry John F. Kennedy and and that of course this is also a I mean, this is documented and established that they had an affair. I mean, the FBI agents uh, they wrote uh, down in detail how often they made love every night and when uh, it came, etc. Et so, uh, but uh, the Joseph Kennedy was very uh, upset about this uh, because he said, "Oh, his son uh, was sort of uh, already tainting his potentially his potential future career by being associated with." Uh, a Nazi spy like Inga Arvid and she was also uh, the FBI thought that she was also uh, Axel Wenergren's lover and the reason they thought that is because Axel Wenergren uh, wrote her several checks one over three thousand dollars well three thousand dollars in uh, 1942 was, uh, was a bit of money but they never had an affair uh, Axel simply uh, paid Salary for Fagels who was in uh, in Peru and they, they, they had a business uh, relationship. Uh, but Inga was, yeah, she was very uh, attractive. But Axel was, uh, I think, uh, time uh, 35 years older, which uh, uh, would have been <laughs> uh, quite something. Uh, so here's the case that. Uh, or that he was blacklisted because of his Nazi uh, activities and Nazi spies. Uh, there were there was testimony that on the Southern Cross he had uh, taken the Nazi gold to uh, Argentina and he had been hiding there. He was the sort of the bank for Hermann Göring. I mean, one fiction after the other. And on January 14, 1942, he was uh, indeed put on uh, the blacklist. Uh, this is a month after Pearl Harbor and at the time Vena Green is in, as I said before, in Mexico uh, going to invest uh, a lot of uh, money together with uh, several other business uh, men. And, uh, The U.S. authorities were concerned about his plans 
development in Peru and in uh, Mexico even more, thinking that uh, this was the soft uh, underbelly uh, here and as we know uh, uh, in World War I uh, the Germans had offered Mexico uh, uh, the territories of uh, California, New Mexico, uh, Texas, and Arizona back if uh, Mexico would have entered on the, the side of Germany in, into the war. And that was uh, then transmitted uh, by uh, the Swedish uh, ambassador. In <laughs> uh, so Swedes were considered uh, suspicious by and uh, and also uh, particularly those that had a, a lot of money and were competing with uh, uh, U.S. capital. Uh, at Vienna Green was so well connected that the U.S. government was afraid about a backlash. So they, they had the U.S. ambassadors in uh, Peru and in Mexico personally go and explain to the presidents why Wenegrain was uh, blacklisted and that he really was the, this dangerous uh, Nazi uh, spy, even though there was of course some uh, uh, doubt within uh, the U.S. administration that, that this was really true. Uh, here he is. This is General Maximino Camacho uh, on, uh, on the right. He was the Minister of Defense and then uh, the Minister for Communications, the brother of President Camacho, uh, Venegrin's best friend. Uh, the day before Pearl Harbor, Venegrin uh, uh, tried to sail back on the Southern Cross uh, to the Bahamas and he had the daughter of President Camacho with him and then when he learned about the attack of Pearl Harbor he thought that uh, his ship might be torpedoed so he returned to Mexico so that's why he was in, uh, in Mexico uh, uh, making business deal deals with uh, Camacho at the time and he was considered the economic czar of, uh, of Mexico uh, here he is in the in the middle, uh, uh, this is Eric Hawksater, who was running his Mexican business. Uh, he had been the the first uh, uh, captain of the of the boat. This is his uh, foster son, uh, Amand Prunel, and uh, so mostly these are directors of uh, Electrolux and uh, the. The reason, so when I went through this whole file, uh, the, FBI. the FBI file, and I started out uh, thinking there was something uh, I had to find. And no, I didn't find anything. Uh, there is a, a censored file and an uncensored file. and. But then in the archives of the foundation in New York, they had a copy of the censored file uh, that was an earlier co copy than the one that they have at the National Archives. So I'm, I'm reading through this, and this is from 1959. The, the FBI, uh, the blacklist was uh, eliminated in 1946. That's in Rennegrin, uh came off the blacklist, he, uh, he became immediately again uh, a superstar. He was in, uh, invited to uh, the inauguration of, uh, of Eisenhower. He was, uh, uh, had again enormous uh, business ventures. Uh, but in, uh, in, the in 1959 he wanted to clear his name. So he sued the U.S. Uh, State Department, the Treasury Department, the Justice Department, and uh, the Justice Department uh, ordered the director of the FBI to give them the file. Uh, Herbert Hoover 
I said, no. Uh, he said, they have all the documents. No, they're not giving us the file. Herbert Huber was so obsessed with Wendegreen that uh, he had two special agents fly to the Nuremberg war uh, uh, tribunal to interview Göring about Axel Wendegreen. And Göring confirmed that they had nothing uh, to do with each other. So uh, I find this file and here it says the real reason why Wendegreen was placed on the proclaimed list, this is written by the number two uh, person of the FBI to the Attorney General of the United States who is technically the boss. And it says, uh, during uh, December 1941, information was developed that negotiations were underway leading up to the creation of an export control board in Mexico which was to have an official status, yet was to be financed exclusively by Axel Wenegrain. If the board had been created in the form discussed, Wenegrain would have become the economic czar of Mexico. And then it goes on, and that's why uh, uh, I recommend the blacklist. They had to do it so quickly that they didn't follow the, the procedures, uh, because all the agencies would have had to get together to uh, uh, agree on that. Uh, President Roosevelt said, I don't care, I, I sign uh, uh, just a special order, they put it into a, a list that already existed, and all of a sudden, Benegrin's assets in Sweden, United States, Bahamas, everywhere were frozen, and he was sitting in uh, Mexico. And it was so difficult to get money, uh, get access to his fund that he almost went bankrupt. And uh, this was his darkest time from uh, 42 till uh, uh, 46. And just to show you that the Americans are not that stupid, uh, they knew what Mexi what Axel Wenegrin could have done if they would not have eliminated him. As soon as he came off the blacklist, uh, this is what he created, the Mexican phone company. Uh, well, this man owns the Mexican phone company now, the richest man in the world, and it is on the base of these, this telecommunication company that he has uh, created his, uh, his whole wealth. And uh, not only does he own Telmex, which uh, Axel Wenegrin founded. Uh, at the time, there were two phone companies. One uh, uh, was owned by L.M. Ericsson, and one was owned by IT&T. And every Mexican, uh, uh, normal Mexican uh, who could afford it, had two phones with two lines, because uh, if you were a subscriber to L.M. Ericsson, then you couldn't talk to the people from IT&T, and vice versa. And Wenegrin uh, merged those two and uh, was the majority uh, stockholder. And Carlos Slim, uh, not only does he uh, uh, own the phone company, he also owns uh, uh, the estate that Axel Wenegrin had. That, that hotel, uh, that, uh, the Rancho Cortez, is, uh, that is uh, also owned by, by Carlos Slim. Well, after Wendegrin died in uh, the 19, 1961, uh, uh, he had appointed a, a successor who uh, was, if anything, a better salesperson uh, than Wendegrin and sold himself to uh, Wendegrin, who was totally incapable of running uh, an empire like Wendegrin's. And so, uh, there was an incredible bankruptcy that uh, some of you uh, might still remember because it didn't end until the 1980s uh, because it took the Swedish authorities decades to <laughs> finally find out how this all uh, hang together. But uh, from uh, the, the funds that were left uh, at his uh, death uh, and what he had endowed earlier, uh, like the Wenegrinska Samfundet was the first uh, was it 
created in 1937. Uh, of course, uh, the king was uh, on the on the board. Uh, the foundation was tax exempt.